Good morning and welcome to the house of the Lord this morning. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunities to come to worship you, to sing your praises, and to hear your word. We ask that we open our ears and our, heart, our hearts to hear your message. Amen. Are there any announcements for the work of the church this week? Is it not on? Just a reminder that the uh, next opportunity to serve at the Kokomo Rescue Mission is coming up on Saturday, September 1st, and there's a sign-up sheet in the narthex. Thanks. All right. Will you please stand and join me for the call to worship? Welcome today to, to a celebration of God's love. We are grateful to love. Feeling the loving power of God flow into your lives. Come, let us worship God who is always with us.
God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? And if our God is for us, then who could ever stop us? And if our God is with us, then what can stand against? to see all of you out there and it's nice to see the sun shining through the windows. Um, I'm not going to lie, my heart's kind of heavy today and um, I'm just so thankful that I can be here to um, be reassured that God is our God and he is our savior, he is with us. I just know of so many adult parents right now that are dealing with issues with their adult children. Um, mental health issues, addiction, some have lost, lost their children, children that have cancer or that have had a traumatic car accident and they're just trying to get back to normal. And those, those just are weighing heavy on me because a lot of those are within my own family right now. And um, I just know that God is with them, God does not leave them, God will be with them through the storms. I just pray that they can reach for him and get comfort and strength. And I just ask a special prayer today for those that are struggling and those parents that um, are figuring out how they can help their children. So I felt like the songs today were very appropriate. Um, our God is greater. He's our cornerstone and he's our hope. So. Let's keep singing and be hopeful and thankful and joyful that he's in our lives. Jesus. 
Thank you, praise team. This time I have a children's story. Good morning. How are you this morning? Is everybody good? Are you good back there, Abigail? Okay. I have a question for you. Have you ever heard the word unexpected? Yeah? Good. In case you haven't, something that is unexpected is something that is a surprise. For example, if I came to church this morning, came in, left my keys in the car and locked the car, that would be unexpected and a surprise. Thank goodness I didn't do that. Or sun shining it's beautiful outside you want to go outside and play and it starts to rain that's kind of unexpected and a surprise today's scripture story jesus does some things i think most of us would find unexpected the story begins with a woman asking jesus to heal her daughter Instead of saying yes or no, Jesus ignores her, which is the first unexpected thing he does. Then, when she keeps asking him for help, he tells her that he can't be bothered with a request because there are other people he is supposed to help instead. That this is a very unexpected thing for Jesus to say. And most likely, the woman did not expect this response from Jesus either. But the woman does not give up. Instead, she gives Jesus reasons why he should help her. And you know what? Jesus decides he does want to help her. He changes his mind, and he heals the woman's daughter. What I appreciate about this story is that the woman doesn't give up. It doesn't matter what unexpected things happen 
she just keeps asking for help. And eventually, that help is offered to her. I think this story is told because it helps us think about what happens when we ask God for help. We might expect certain things to happen when we ask for help in prayer, but instead, unexpected things might happen instead. Those unexpected things might make us feel like we shouldn't have asked for help and that we should have just quit asking God for help. But what we see in today's story is a reminder that when unexpected things happen after asking for help, that we should keep asking for help, keep praying to God. And when we do, when we keep asking for help, just like the woman kept asking for help, then we more likely are more likely to receive the help we are asking for. And that's good news for today. Can you pray with me? Heavenly Father, sometimes we think our prayers go unanswered, but they really don't. You just have a different plan for us. And we know we need to keep asking. We ask these things in your name. Amen. This morning is our teacher dedication, and instead of coming up front like we normally do, I'm just going to ask you to stand where you are this morning. So um, I am very grateful and appreciative to each and every one of you who has said yes to teach or to help in some way. It's always um, a scary thought for me when it says it's time to look for Sunday school teachers. So. I am very, very thankful to each and every one of you for saying yes. So our nursery help is Christine Phelps, Kathy Wells, and Robin Hooker. Kindergarten through fifth grade, Mona Carroll, Karen Stahl, Barb Corwin. Junior, senior high, Carrie Bush, Greg Cunningham, Joe, and Candace Good. The adult classes find their own Sunday school teachers, so if you teach an adult class, would you please stand? Our church school secretary is Nancy Anderson, and Steve Phelps is her assistant. And again, I thank each and every one of you for all that you do for us and our children and our adults. And Pastor Mark has a prayer of dedication. Let's pray. Almighty God, creator of the heavens and the earth, you are the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You have sent your Holy Spirit to guide us, and you have given us your word to instruct us as we journey through this life. As we celebrate a new year of Sunday school, we remember our relatives and mentors, our leaders and teachers who led us to faith by singing us songs and telling us stories about the Bible, by welcoming and accepting us, by praying for us without our knowing, and by showing us how to follow Jesus. Today we celebrate a new year of learning about the Bible, God's story. We celebrate its message of love and grace, healing and hope. We celebrate the many ways we can respond and share this story. Oh God, we give you thanks for all these teachers who offer their time and talents to teach us God's word. We thank you for this congregation who supports the faith nurture of our children, youth, and adults. We thank you for parents and caregivers who nurture their children at home. And we thank you for children who come with energy and enthusiasm, ready and willing to learn more about God and his love for us. And Lord Jesus, today we dedicate these teachers, ourselves, and this year of Sunday school to you. May we grow as followers of Jesus Christ through it, and may our learning and worshiping together inspire us to share your love and salvation with confidence, both at home and away. 
Bless us, Lord, so that we can be a blessing to others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our offertory thought this morning, commit your work to the Lord and then your plans will succeed. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 3. A reminder that the Brethren Service Cup is for Jackson Street Commons. Will the ushers please come forward? We pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts that were given. We ask that you help us to use your gifts wisely. In your name we pray. Amen. We stand, if you're able, for hymn number 555, I Need Thee Every Hour.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. From Matthew, chapter 15, beginning with verse 21. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him, crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word. So his disciples came to him and urged him, Send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. The woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. Yes, Lord, she said, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This is God's word for us today. May God add his blessings to it. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we come before you today to seek your word for us. Lord, we know that we are living in difficult times when things that we are used to are are usually not happening. And so we seek your word. We seek what you have to say to us this morning. We pray, Lord, that you would give us minds that can understand your word, hearts that will receive it, and fill us with your Holy Spirit so that we can have hope as we carry out your word in our daily lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our world has changed so much in the past six months. Who would have thought that a small, invisible virus from China could spread across the globe so quickly and leave so much destruction in its wake? Here in the United States, over 5 million people have been infected from COVID-19 or with COVID-19 and over 160,000 persons have died from it. And may God's love and peace bring comfort to their families. Who would have thought six months ago that having college football games in the fall would be questionable? Who would have thought six months ago that when the Colts began having regular season games this fall, only 15,000 stands will be attending in a stadium built to hold 63,000 fans? Now, six months ago, you might have worn a face covering outside to keep your face warm because of the cold weather, but who would have thought that back in February you would now be wearing face coverings inside as well as outside when you're not able to practice social distancing. But as they say, desperate times call for desperate Measures. Ever wonder how that phrase originated? Most historians say that the phrase likely originated from a saying of the ancient Greek physician Hippocrates. It appears in his aphorisms. For extreme diseases, extreme methods of cure as to restriction are most suitable. In other words, desperate diseases must have desperate Remedies, or 
as it is more commonly said in our day and age, desperate times call for desperate measures. We are living in desperate times. And desperation can lead a person to do all sorts of things they would have never dreamt of doing under normal circumstances. A few months ago, desperation led people to hoard toilet paper and Clorox or Lysol uh, cleaning wipes. You couldn't find them in stores any place. And I still can't find any Clorox or Lysol disinfectant wipes. And now, some six months later, desperation is leading people to hoard canning jar lids. Yes, you heard me right. Canning jar lids are being hoarded. You can't find them anywhere. I had my mom look in South Dakota and my sister look in South Dakota. They couldn't find any. I couldn't find any here in Kokomo. I know the Corwins went to Illinois. They couldn't find any in Illinois. I mean, it seems like there's a nationwide shortage of canning lids. But there is some hope. Last night, Karen came back from Myers with a couple boxes of canning lids. So they must be resupplying them. Now, on the more serious side, desperation can lead people or can lead to spikes in depression and suicide. Now, our scripture today is about a woman who was desperate. She was desperate for help because her daughter was suffering terribly from demon possession. Now, unlike many other stories of demon possession in the Bible, we don't know exactly how this demon possession was being manifested in the life of this woman's daughter. Did it cripple her? Did it make her foam at the mouth? Did it cause her to have seizures? Did she throw herself into the fire? Did it give her, cause her to to harm herself or, or do something else bad? We don't know. But what we do know is that watching her daughter suffer from demon possession caused this woman great pain and suffering herself. She became desperate to find some way or someone to heal her daughter. Now let me ask you this. If your son or daughter was possessed by a demon, how desperate would you be to find someone who could help your son or daughter? To what lengths would you go to to help your child get better? How many doctors would you go to to find a cure? Would you be willing to go outside the established medical fields to find help for your child? Would you go to the best musicians and or exorcists around? You know, this woman probably spent a fortune doing all that but without any positive results. Her daughter was still possessed. And she got to the point where she was so desperate that she was ready to do whatever it took to get her daughter help. Now our text begins with Jesus leaving a place where he had just had a controversy with the Pharisees and the teachers of the law over what's clean and what's unclean. And he goes to a place that the Jews would have considered unclean, the region of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Tyre was a city located on the coastal plain between the mountains of Lebanon and the Mediterranean Sea. It was located in modern-day Lebanon. It was an ancient city north of the Promised Land. And King David employed Tyrian stonemasons and carpenters and used cedars from that area in building a palace and a temple in Jerusalem. Around 870 B.C., King Ahab of the northern kingdom of Israel married Jezebel, the daughter of the Phoenician king. 
And Jezebel brought Baal worship into Israel. Now, as Israel declined in world power, Tyre increased in power. Its ships ruled the sea, and their trade brought vast wealth to this Phoenician city-state. Tyre's citizens became wealthy and proud. And the prophet Ezekiel spoke against Tyre because of its pride. In fact, in Ezekiel chapter 28, the passage where Ezekiel prophesies against Tyre, it's often associated with the story of Satan's downfall. You see, the king of Tyre was proud, just like Satan was before the creation of human beings. Satan had held an important position in the angelic order. He was the guardian cherub, the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty and splendor. And that pride corrupted him and filled him with violence and sin. And as a result, Satan was cast out of heaven and thrown to earth. And so also the king of tears pride led to God's judgment against him. He would be stripped of his beauty and slender, cut off from his wealth and grandeur, and die a horrible death at the hands of ruthless foreigners. And around 573 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonian army conquered the city. And in 332 B.C., Alexander the Great and his forces completely destroyed the city. Now, a couple centuries later, under Roman rule, Tyre again became an important city of trade, though it would never enjoy the dominance it previously held. The citizens of Tyre became wealthy from their trade with Galilee. And while Tyre was well stocked with produce from Galilee, those who grew the food in Galilee often went hungry. And Galilean Jews resented the Tyrians for exploiting them. And there was much hostility between the two groups. Now a Canaanite woman from that vicinity has a daughter who is suffering terribly from demon possession. And this woman had obviously heard about Jesus' reputation as a miracle worker. And she wants Jesus to cast the demon out of her daughter. And the question is, would Jesus heal her daughter? She had numerous strikes against her. Things that might prevent Jesus from casting out that demon. First, she was from a land considered unclean by the Jews. Second, she was from a race considered unclean by the Jews. Mark's gospel tells us in chapter 7, verse 26, that she was a Greek born in Syrian Phoenicia. And while this little tidbit of information doesn't mean much to us living in the 21st century, it said a lot to the Jews living in the 1st century. She was not just a Gentile, but a member of a resented class of privileged foes. I mean, she was like the 1% in our day. She was from the wealthy class, and the way they got their wealth was from exploiting the Galileans. Now remember that Jesus grew up in Nazareth of Galilee. And before he began his public ministry, he was a carpenter. And he may have had some firsthand experience of being taken advantage of by these people from Tyre. The third strike, she was a female. Fourth, her child was possessed by an unclean spirit, a demon. Now, given these four strikes against her, some people may have given up before they even got started, but not this woman. She was desperate to get help for her daughter. And through her story, we learn three things about desperate times. First of all, desperate times call for determination. Desperate times call for determination. Notice how determined she is. She comes to Jesus. She cries out in verse 22, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. And her first appeal to Jesus is met with strange silence. Strike one. 
getting nowhere with Jesus, the text implies that she then appealed to his disciples. And after some time, they come to Jesus and urge him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. And maybe she thought that since Jesus seemed to ignore her, she might be able to convince some of her disciples to bring her case before Jesus. Now, the text doesn't tell us how many appeals she made to them or how long it lasted, but she finally gets a response from Jesus. Jesus says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. Well, who are the lost sheep of Israel? The lost sheep of Israel are the Jewish people. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus calls the 12 apostles, the 12 disciples, and he sends them out on a mission to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. And then he tells them in Matthew chapter 10, verses 5 and 6, do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Now this woman does not fit the primary or she does not fit the parameters of Jesus' primary mission. Strike two. However, her determination leads her to come up to Jesus, to kneel before him and say, Lord, help me. And Jesus' response shocks our sensitivities. Now we assume Jesus is obligated to respond to every request and to hear every appeal and, and heal everyone. We expect Jesus to go with her to where her daughter is and lay his hands on her daughter and to cast out the demon. Or at minimum, we expect Jesus to lovingly say to her something like this, Woman, go, your daughter is healed. But Jesus' response seems cold and unkind, perhaps even prejudiced. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dogs. To better understand Jesus' response, we need to understand who are the children that are sitting at the table, who are the dogs, and what it the bread represents. Now the children are the children of Israel. They are God's chosen people. They are the Jews that are sitting at God's table. And the dogs are the Gentiles, anyone who is not part of the chosen race, anyone who is not a Jew. And the label dog was pejorative. It was derogatory. It was uncomplimentary. To refer to someone as a dog was to insult them. And then bread. The term bread, in Jesus' response, refers to deliverance, freedom, salvation, and life. So Jesus seems to be telling this woman, you know, you people from Tyre are used to being privileged and first in line. But when it comes to spiritual privileges, the Jews are privileged and will have the satisfaction of being first for once. I'm going to help my own family first. Strike three. Most people will give up after three, after three strikes, but not this woman. She simply accepts Jesus' judgment and continues believing that her daughter is worth healing. She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And at that response, Jesus grants her request. How determined are you to get the help you need in desperate times? Are you as determined as Jacob was when he wrestled all night with God saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me? Are you as determined as the widow who kept bothering that judge until he granted her justice? Are you as determined as this Canaanite woman was who would not leave Jesus until Jesus healed her daughter of demon possession? 
Desperate times call for determination. Second, desperate times call for humility. When this woman went to Jesus for help, she did not assume that Jesus would automatically help her. After all, she was a Canaanite and Jesus was a Jew. And there was that long-standing animosity between Canaanites and Jews. And further, she was from the wealthy upper class who didn't associate with folks like Jesus who were from the bottom rung of society's ladder. But she was desperate. And desperate times call for humility. She didn't let the hostility between the Jews and the Canaanites stop her from coming to Jesus and crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. She asked Jesus, to have mercy on her. Now, what is mercy? Dictionaries define mercy as compassion or forgiveness showed towards someone whom it is within one's power to punish or harm. My Bible dictionary defines mercy this way. Mercy is a divine quality in which unworthy people receive grace. Let me repeat that again. Mercy is a divine quality in which unworthy people receive grace. This Canaanite woman, she cried out to Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, for a miracle. For him to have mercy on her because she knew that she, as a Canaanite woman, was unworthy of even having Jesus consider healing her daughter. And how does Jesus respond to her request for mercy? He tells her that his mission is to the lost sheep of Israel, God's chosen people, not the Canaanites. In other words, Jesus tells her, you don't deserve God's mercy. You're unworthy. You're not even a Jew. And she doesn't argue or or get upset by what Jesus says. She humbly accepts her lowly status as a Canaanite and as a woman. And she continues to ask Jesus for help. And when Jesus calls her a dog, she rolls with the punches. She doesn't want to sit at the table and eat bread with the Jews. All she wants is a few crumbs. A few crumbs to heal her daughter. This woman is a great example of the humility that is required to have great faith. She does not resent the privilege of the Jews and their share of God's blessing. She humbly accepts her place and comes to Jesus as everyone must, as a sinner in need of God's grace, as a sinner, poor and needy, ready to gobble down whatever crumbs fall from the table. She knew that Jesus could heal, and she expected him to be gracious, even though she had no claim to his grace. And Jesus admires her wit, her faith, her humility and understanding, and he gives her not a crumb, but the very thing she begged for. Matthew tells us in verse 28 that Jesus said, Or or Matthew tells us in verse 28 that her daughter was healed from that very hour. Desperate times call for humility. And finally, desperate times call for great faith. There are only two people in the Bible who are praised for their great faith in Jesus, and both of them were Gentiles. One was the Roman centurion that we read about in Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13. He had a servant who was paralyzed and suffering terribly. And Jesus was going to go to the centurion's home and heal the servant. But the centurion felt unworthy to have Jesus do so. Instead, he tells Jesus, just say the word and my servant will be healed. The centurion was used to giving commands and having his soldiers and servants carry out his every command. And so he believed that all Jesus needed to do was say a command, and it would be done. And Jesus praised 
his great faith. And he gave a command for his servant to be healed. And the servant was healed that very hour. Now the second person whom Jesus praised for having great faith was this Canaanite woman in our text. Her faith was focused on Jesus Christ. Where did this woman's desperation lead her to? It led her to Jesus. Somewhere, somehow, she had heard about Jesus and his power to heal and cast out demons. She had learned that he was the Jewish Messiah because she addresses, his, she addresses him as Lord, Son of David. Now, we don't know how much else she knew about Jesus, but the little knowledge she did have about him was enough for her to believe in him. Now, as her conversation with Jesus ensued, she knelt before Jesus. And the Greek word translated in some versions as worshipped, and here translated as knelt, was only used to describe kneeling in worship. This woman knelt before Jesus. She worshipped Jesus. She sought out Jesus because in faith she recognized Jesus to be God. In faith she believed that if she took her burden to Jesus, he would be the only one who could and would help her. Great faith flows from desperation and it focuses on Jesus Christ. Why is it so important for us to focus our faith on Jesus Christ? Because faith is only as great as its object. Who do you have more faith in? Mortal man or the immortal God? Do you trust more in human wisdom or God's wisdom? Do you rely more on human strength or God's strength? How you answer makes all the difference. With our modern sensibilities, we find it difficult to understand how the Israelites could fashion a, a golden calf from jewelry and then fall down to worship it. Because that had only recently been a nice earring or a gold bracelet or someone's family heirloom. And we wonder to ourselves, how stupid were those Israelites to think that those things were their gods who brought them up out of Egypt? And yet, is worshiping a golden calf so different from trusting in our own wealth or 401k or earthly possessions? We think, oh my, if only I could win the Powerball lottery, I'd have no more worries I'd never be sad or lonely or unfulfilled again. Now really? Can money buy love? Can wealth purchase the forgiveness of your sins? Can a dollar bill pay for your eternal salvation? No. Faith relies solely on God. And this reliance on Jesus Christ is what made the Canaanite woman's faith great. What do you need to make it through these troubling times? Desperate times call for determination, humility, and great faith in Jesus Christ. May God increase your faith today. Amen. For a hymn of response, invite your hymn books to 366, God of Grace.
Now is the time for sharing of joys and concerns. If you have something on your heart that you'd like to bring before the Lord this morning, uh, we do have Rod with the cordless mic, so just raise your hand and he will bring it to you. I am Jim Wan. Just forgot during the announcement to mention the hunger walk that's coming up on uh, September 20th, I think it is, Sunday, September 20th, which is not many weeks from this week. Um, so what we're looking for is there's a table in the, in the fellowship hall where you can sign up to be a walker, you can sign up to be a sponsor. Those are the two that we need to work on right now. Uh, walkers, please check the sponsors list and get, uh, get pledges. So thanks. I have a prayer request. This is Barb. Um, my friend's little sister, Mia Renosa, is going to start chemo this Wednesday, well, the 18th. Um, she'll do four rounds of chemo, spaced uh, a week or so apart. And then after the chemo, she will have six weeks of radiation treatment up in Chicago. So if you can keep Mia Renosa in your prayers, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, this is Renee. Um, first of joy, uh, Greg's mom turned 96 yesterday, and so that's pretty awesome, and uh, so that was just a real joy. Um, I would like to ask prayers for um, a friend of Cameron's. His name is Josh Johnson, and he, um, long story short, he's struggling with some mental issues. But he will not get any help at this point. And, um, <clears throat> you know, when you're 31 years old and you're an adult, it's hard as parents to convince their children to get help. So um, I'm praying that Josh will seek help. And then for Jennifer, um, Jennifer Cunningham Nichols, which I know many of you know, um, she has had some struggles here in the last couple weeks, and she's currently in the hospital getting help. So I just pray that um, she can also get the help that she requires. Hello, this is Candace Good, and I'd like to request um, prayer for the Riles family. They seem to have had a slew of issues um, but Sean, the most recent one, uh, Thursday, he was at soccer practice and really messed up his knee. And so he's going to go in for an MRI on Monday to see if surgery is required. Um, and then Nolan's struggling with his psoriasis. So please pray for them with their physical issues. And then Madeline's nervous about going back to Purdue um, this next week, I think. So just prayers for their whole family. If there is no one else, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Gracious and merciful God, your word says that you answer people when they call on your name and that you deliver them. Right now, we ask that you would heal those who are sick and those who are carrying the COVID-19 virus without knowing it. Heal them and protect those around them. We ask that you would please provide a cure for the coronavirus. We also ask that you would replace the hatred in our nation with love, the violence with peace, the inequities with justice, and the economy with prosperity. We ask that you would bring a quick and miraculous end to the darkness in our world. Merciful God, we pray for the concerns that have been mentioned this morning. We pray for Mia Renosa as she begins chemotherapy in Chicago. Lord, we ask that you would give her strength for she, that she needs for this fight. 
Be with our family and friends. Grant them your peace. And uh, give me an encouragement through, and hope through this time. Lord, we celebrate with the Cunninghams and uh, Greg's mom turning 96. Uh, what a blessing it is to have lived that long and to have been able to experience so much. And we just pray that you would continue to be with her, Lord, so that her family and loved ones may continue to learn from her and enjoy their time with her. Lord, we pray for Cameron's friend, Josh Johnson, as he struggles with mental illness. Lord, we <clears throat> also pray for Jennifer Cunningham as she struggles with that as well. And Lord, and we know that there are many others who are struggling with various mental illnesses. Um, and Lord, help them. First, that they would seek help from professionals. And second, that you would surround them with caring and understanding people people who are kind and patient with them, and bring the healing to their minds that they need. And Lord, we pray for the Riles family. We pray for healing for Sean's knee. We pray for healing for Nolan's psoriasis. And fill Maddie with peace as she's nervous about returning to Purdue this fall. Merciful God, whether your healing comes today, next week, next month, or next year, we believe that you do heal. And we pray that you would heal our loved ones, that you would heal our world, our nation, our communities, and our homes. And we will continue to trust you and praise your holy name as we wait for your response. And one more prayer, Lord, we thank you for being with Richard Hooker through his eye surgery this past Friday. We thank you for how well things went. And continue to be with him and watch over him as he recovers. Grant him patience and perseverance and hope during this time. We pray that you would restore his vision. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. For our closing hymn, I invite you to stand and turn in your hymn books to hymn number 425, Come, Come Ye Saints, hymn 425. <clears throat>
Go forth in faith, knowing that God is always with you. Go forth in courage, knowing that God will always lead you. Go forth in peace, confident that God will help you. To God be the glory in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.